Hi, I'm Michael Popa, Executive Director of Mainstream Coalition, and thank you for joining this candidate forum co-presented by the League of Women Voters of Johnson County, ACLU of Kansas, Dot Votes, Mid-America LGBT Chamber of Commerce, and Mainstream Coalition. Soon we'll hear from nine candidates running for the Unified Government of Wyandotte County and Kansas City, Kansas Board of Commissioners. However, all 15 candidates on the August ballot were invited to participate. We're offering a closed caption service through a third party provider. If you don't see the closed captions on screen, uh, go ahead and click the CC button at the bottom. Uh, if time permits at the end, we will take questions from the audience joining us uh, on Zoom. Uh, so please use the Q&A feature located next to the CC button on the bottom of your screen to submit your question. I'm gonna place a link to the forum guidelines in chat, but I'll hit some highlights here. Each question will be asked to all candidates. Candidates will then have two minutes to answer each of the questions and then a one minute closing at the end of the forum. For remaining time, we will be tracking that in the chat box. Um, so make sure that your chat box is open if you wanna see how much time is remaining for each candidate. The partner organizations co-sponsoring this forum believe that democracy works best when citizens are informed and active. So thank you so much for taking the time to learn about the candidates currently running for office and the important issues surrounding these races. And now I would like to welcome our moderator for this uh, forum, Valeria Espadas with the Safe and Welcoming Wyandotte Coalition. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. On behalf of the Safe and Welcoming Coalition, I uh, just want to say thank you to all the sponsors and all the candidates for being here tonight. Um, and we can get started uh, if everyone is ready. Uh, but first, I will also like to introduce all of our uh, candidates for tonight. So from District 1, tonight we do have Gail Townsend. And also from District 1, we have Lisa Walker Yeager. Hello, everyone. And now the candidates for District 8, we have Andrew Davis. Good evening, everyone. And District 8 as well, Jeffrey Kump. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. And with us tonight also to see her, Cece Mink. Hello. And for at-large District 2 candidates, we have Tom Burroughs. Excuse me, I'm in District 8 also. Oh, I am so sorry about that. Skipped right over that. Okay. And also candidate for District 8, we have Diana Whittington. Glad to be here. Thank you. Do you want to include the incumbent also or not? Commissioner? For district? For eight? Yes, I believe we have Ms. Jane Philbrook with us tonight. And our at large District 2 candidates, we have the incumbent Tom Burroughs. Good evening. And our other candidate for at-large district two, Ned Kelly. Thank you, Val. Thank you, everybody. So if we are all ready, I will just jump right into the first question. Uh, first up, Gail Townsend, tell us about your connection to the community and how that relates to your interest in the unified government policies. Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Moderator, and good evening to everyone. I do want to apologize. Uh, rather than not participate, I am not feeling well, so that's why you have a picture instead of me. But um, I am a Wyandotte County uh, native, graduate of Sumner High School, um, and my first connection with the community started at the tender age of, say, six or seven, watching my parents in the neighborhood in which I grew up conduct uh, and be a part of uh, neighborhood meetings. So that has stayed with me forever. As commissioner, it's only been enhanced by my opportunity to meet a variety of neighborhoods within District 1. 
uh, am part of the community. I think people forget sometimes that the commissioners, everything that happens to my constituents, a good part of it happens to me as well. So um, as a commissioner, that is secondary to the fact that I am a member of the KCK Wyandotte community. Thank you for that response. And I will hop over to Lisa Walker. Hi, yes, my name is Lisa Walker Yeager. I am a native, I grew up in Parkwood. Um, this is where I grew up at. I went to school at Notre Dame de Sion High School. My family is from Rosedale. Um, they settled in Rosedale for many years. Um, my grandmother and my grandfather, my grandma was one of the first nurses and my grandfather uh, uh, was a mailman, uh, one of the first black postmasters. And my grandmother's one of the first nurses uh, here in Kansas City. So my family is native to Wyandotte County as well as I am. Um, one of the key factors is, is that I pride myself on being a mother first, as well as a actual neighbor, as well as an actual uh, friend. So I'm not a politician. Um, the key factor might me not being a politician. That means I care about everybody in my community. I have been a community activist for many years um, before this position. I work with the houseless. So I, um, I'm pretty much aware of some of the things that are going on within our community and how to fix and have solutions for them. Thank you for that. And now to Andrew Davis. Good evening, everyone. Um, yes, my name is Andrew Davis. I'm running for the 8th District. Um, I'm fairly new to Wyandotte County. Moved here last year uh, from Lawrence. Uh, my wife and I, we got married three years ago. and We decided to put down roots here uh, in KCK. And so uh, we decided to buy our first home here in the district. And since then, I've hit the ground running. Um, I was a, a mentor uh, uh, this past semester for the Learning Club, and so it's been, uh, it was great investing in the next generation of leaders. I was also a judge on the uh, Young Entrepreneurs, Young KCK Entrepreneurs, excuse me. Uh, since then, um, uh, in addition to that, I've worked with the Voter to Voter Network and for the 2020 election, mobilized my peers here and back at school uh, to get out the vote. And so. Um, those have been my connections to the community, and obviously I want to put down deeper roots because I do care about Wyandotte County, and uh, yeah, my, my present and future is here. Thank you. Thank you for that, Andrew. And now, uh, Jeffrey Kump, please tell us about your connection to the community and how that relates to your interest in unified government policy. So, uh, conversely, I have been deeply rooted in Wyandotte County my entire life. Um, uh, my, uh, actually my grandparents came from Germany after World War II and settled in Wyandotte County on my dad's side. And then on my mother's side, uh, my, my grandfather was a police officer in Wyandotte County. My father is a retired Kansas City, Kansas police officer. And my mother is currently a nurse and, uh, one of her favorite places she ever worked was at Bethany hospital. So I have been raised and rooted in Wyandotte County my entire life. I always had the, the understanding that I would be living here my entire life as well. Uh, I went to Bishop Ward High School, uh, met a lot of great people there. I had the opportunity to go play at the University of St. Mary's in Leavenworth, uh, played football there. And then I had the opportunity to receive my law degree at the University of Kansas. And the first thing I did after I took the bar uh, was uh, take my wife and, and find a home in Wyandotte County of our own instead of living with my parents. And, and we were happy to find a house and I am continued to to be rooted here, um, you know, my my jobs I do now um, directly affect the people in the area, especially those of Wyandotte County, and, and I want to continue to do that. Uh, and I anticipate that not only myself but my family will also continue to be rooted in Wyandotte County um, for for now on. I have one son now, another one on the way, and they'll be born and raised in Wyandotte County as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now uh, to see your CC make. Um, yes, I was born and raised in Wyandotte County. Both of my um, maternal and paternal grandparents came here around World War I um, and they stayed here or they made a home 
in Wyandotte County. After that, my uh, mother's uh, my mother's side, my grandfather on that side was an auxiliary police officer. My grandfather was a firefighter um, on 27th and by Clan Park at that fire station for, I believe, 28 years. My grandmother um, was, worked at AT&T and has lived here all her life, all, all my grandparents anyway, um, and my family as well. Um, but I've also worked at the recreation center. I grew up in the rest, recreation centers and um, I've worked in the recreation centers as far as it pertains to volunteering with the children, um, also at Parkwood. Um, um, and I've been to all the, well, just about all the meetings um, up until the pandemic started when it went on Zoom. I kind of stopped attending the meetings. I've been very active um, as far as it pertains to BPU and the unified government um, meetings, budgets and all that, so. Thank you very much. And now, uh, Deanna Whittington. Hello. Um, thank you. I'm so happy for this opportunity tonight. I was um, a Kansas native. I was born in um, a little, I grew up close to uh, Emporia, Kansas. Grew up on a farm and went to Emporia State and came here immediately after graduating from college to teach in KCK. And I have taught for the last 42 years in Kansas City, Kansas, and have lived here most of all that time. I um, decided to run, it's very important to me that we keep our best and brightest. And over the years, I have seen so many of our best and brightest young people move away and go to greener pastures and we can't blame them, but I want Wyandotte County, I want this to be the place that they wanna to come to and stay. I want this to be their home forever. And so um, that's why it's very important to me. I love Wyandotte County and uh, it's, it's my home. Thank you very much. And now we'll go to uh, Jane Philbrook. Tell us about your connection to the community and how that relates to your interest in unified government policy. Well, first off, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with you tonight. Um, so my connection with the community is deep because I've been an optometrist in this community for 30 years. My, grand, my great grandfather came over from Germany and settled here. They, he was a jeweler called Winkler's Jewelry. And um, then my father came when he was 21 years old and set down roots and that's both sides. So I'm a fourth generation dot and a third generation optometrist in this community. When you're an optometrist, you get to know your folks pretty well over the years. And so what happens with them matters to you because you care about people or you wouldn't do this job. Um, there isn't anything that is not important to me about the community and we have made great strides over the last few years. There's been a lot of changes and there's a lot of changes to go and I'm happy to be part of that. I want to continue to care for my folks in Wyandotte County and do what I can to make their lives better. My involvement in um, homelessness and that uh, with the homeless population and also with workforce over all these years and with Wyandotte Economic Development all linking together has been able to pull a lot of people together to work for the future of our community. And I hope to continue doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now to Tom Burroughs. Well, thank you. Uh, like many of the previous speakers, I've, I've lived in Wyandotte County my entire life. And I, don't, I, I would say at least three to four generations back, many of us are uh, worked with, many of the family worked with the railroad. There's not an area of Wyandotte County I haven't lived in uh, during, out my, during my lifetime. Uh, I started out, up in the Fundero area, went to Bryant School for a while, then moved over to the Argentine area and went to Stanley School. And then from there, I moved out a little further west and went to Coronado. And from Coronado, uh, I went to Washington High School. And from Washington High School, like many uh, in this community, I had an opportunity to go to college, but went to work to pro uh, provide for myself in a, in a community that's offered me a tremendous amount of opportunity. Uh, from that, I went back to the community college, worked on a degree, 
and was able to uh, volunteer for a number of organizations. The United Way, I was the first United Way loaned executive, uh, labor loaned executive, and served two years. I was fortunate enough to work for Colgate Palmolive Company, a Fortune 100 company in Wyandotte County, 29 year career at Colgate. And through my uh, employment there, they were a very good community supporter in allowing me to serve on numerous boards. I sat on our as chairman of the credit union for 25 years, served on the American Red Cross as vice chair. As I stated, the United Way program, March of Dimes, received numerous community service awards. My connection to Wyandotte County is extensive. And the purpose of that is I absolutely value and love my community, the diversity that my, my community provides the young people as well as myself to uh, work not only locally and regionally, but nationally and internationally. So uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Uh, I look forward to answering any other questions. Thank you very much. And now we will go over to Ted Kelly, Ned Kelly. So sorry. Th Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Ned Kelly. Kelly is spelled K-E-L-L-E-Y, and there's no relation whatsoever to the current governor of Kansas. want to make that quite clear. And I may have the award, I may win the prize for being the newest uh, newcomer to Wyandotte County. I uh, actually moved here just a few months ago. I moved to Kansas a few years ago, but the issues that are important are pretty universal. I've been involved in politics and in the Libertarian Party for a couple of decades, over two decades, and involved in several campaigns and actions. Most recently, I was the chair of the Libertarian Party of Kansas for two years. So again, the, those issues are universal. What is important to me, and it's important to Wyandotte County, is liberty. It's freedom, financial freedom, it's medical freedom, and personal freedom. I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to talk more about all of those things. Um, but that is why I'm running, uh, to reduce the size of government, to increase the size of freedom. And some would say, perhaps, uh, it's time for some fresh new faces anyway. So thank you. Thank you, Ned. And now I will also uh, like to introduce for running for district one candidate Melvin Williams is joining us for the debate. How was that? What? And Melvin Williams, I believe he has also joined. How you doing? So, Melvin, why don't you tell us about your connections to the community? and how that relates to your interest in unified government policy. I'm born and raised here in Wanda County. I'm 43 years old. I have a successful real estate company, Presidential Flips. Uh, pride myself on making each property affordable with different options, owner finance, if they can't afford the full price. Um, my main thing is here, I think it's time for a change around here. I'm tired of leadership not hearing the people when they're elected by the people. That's pretty much it. I want Thank to be a you. voice for the community. Thank you very much, Melvin. And now we will jump over to our second question and we will start with Lisa Walker Yeager. And the question is, do you support the full safe and welcoming ordinance proposed by the safe and welcoming coalition, which includes both the municipal ID and the ICE non-compliance? Um, it has been my, can you hear me? Uh, okay. Yes, okay. It has been said that Wanda County is the nation's second most diverse community where we are privileged to live in an area where there is no ethnic majority. Um, we have a long welcome people of different races, culture, backgrounds, religions, and ethnicities as our friends and neighbors. For this reason, I support the safe and welcome ordinance. But by enacting this ordinance, we can ensure that all people of Wyandotte County are able to obtain official recognized identification. Um, but this means not only including 
um, immigrants, but we also should include uh, most of our homeless because these are some of the programs, the problems, members that are also our homeless members, simply by having the IDs and our residents will have like a full access to engage in all parts of our society and economy. Immigrants and homelessness, individuals in the community will be assured that private information will not be, uh, will be uh, safe. Also, they also su both suffer intimidation in their own uh, county and homes uh, or home houselessness. And I say their homes because their tents as we just, anybody see what's going on in the, uh, in the news right now. Um, that's how they're losing their IDs. Um, additionally, this will also allow public safety officers to focus on our community safety issues and concerns. Um, immigration enforcement and regulation is a federal concern and it should be handled by the federal government agencies, not Wyandotte County. And um, actually the police. And Thank I welcome you. and encourage the integration of immigrants. Thank you, Lisa. And now to Andrew Davis. Yeah, thank you so much for the question, Val. So a lot of the reasons, you know, that uh, Lisa gave are reasons why I support Safe and Welcoming. You can check out my Facebook uh, page. I explain everything in a detailed video. What I want to use this time to focus on are some of the arguments against safe and welcoming and why I do not believe that they hold muster. So um, one of the uh, arguments against safe and welcoming has been the possibility that Wyandotte County or KCK could lose funding. That idea came from the former president who has said a lot of things that you and I and a lot of people on this call, I would hope, do not believe in. And so um, I do not believe that we, uh, uh, as a, a city, as a county, accepting safe and welcoming, I do not think that puts us at odds with federal funding. Roland Park has done something similar. Uh, Lawrence, the city of Lawrence has done something similar. We've seen cities across the nation do something similar and not lose federal funding. And so um, I want to, to stress the importance of that particular uh, response against safe and welcoming. I think it is ridiculous that we have a taco trail and we are promoting something that does come from our Latinx communities, particularly our Mexican communities. And then when they're asking for basic, and I mean basic uh, uh, amenities and basic resources, we are saying no. Uh, our immigrant communities are doing the revitalizing of our neighborhoods. They are providing a tax base that we can benefit from and that we can throw into the pot so that we can distribute for other services. And so uh, in addition to uh, the ID for felons and for those that may not have any identification, I am 100% all for it. Thank you so much for that question. Thank you, Andrew. And now to Jeffrey Cope. Do you support the full safe and welcoming ordinance proposed by the safe and welcoming coalition, which includes both the municipal ID and the ICE non-compliance? I think what's important about that question is, is to look at who that really does affect. And, and uh, we've all discussed and heard that, that it affects the immigrants and, and the immigrant community, uh, especially the, the growth of Hispanic community in Wyandotte County has been vital to do the continued growth. And, um, you know, the, the revitalization of our downtown areas in Wyandotte County, i I've seen, you know, 10th and Central become a great uh, small business area. Um, I, I love the, the growth of our in, immigrant community. And I do agree that we need to have protections for that. With that being said, I still think there is some concern about um, the, the protections that we can provide as UG commissioners. Uh, I, I have, I've watched both of the forums as well as spoken with some members outside. Um, I, I still have not read the case files, but I still think there are some concerns on the potential uh, jurisdiction of, of a sheriff and as someone who may override a, a um, ordinance uh, via their policies um, for, for their officers. Uh, I, I do believe that, that the immigrant community needs to be protected. I am 100% for uh, the ID uh, for, for both the immigrant community and for our homeless population. I am also 100% for having a conversation about full, safe, and welcoming. I believe that is something that the UG needs to do. I believe that is something that our community needs to do. Um, that, that involves a deeper connection with our community uh, because I want our community to feel safe and to give out information of themselves without being fearful of deportation 
especially people who have done so much for Wyandotte County. Um, it, it, it's just not something that I want to happen to, to those community members. Uh, I, I believe that we need to have a conversation. So I, I am in full support of having a conversation, hopefully finding a path that is um, not only legal and successful, but, but will survive challenges potentially in court or from people that may be against it. Uh, so I will say, I think that they, we are in the right direction, hopefully with some of these discussions and with these ordinances that we are proposing, but I still think there is some uh, conversation that needs to happen and I am 100% for being part of those conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. And uh, to see her, CC Mink. Um, yes, first of all, I want to apologize. I'm not a person of a lot of words. I'm a person of action. Um, I've already been in action in Wyandotte County. And as far as the municipal IDs go, um, whether I'm in the seat or not, I will be in support of it because not only is Wyandotte County full of immigrants, but America is full of immigrants. So I support anything that makes this a safe and welcoming place for all immigrants. Thank you. And to uh, Diana Whittington. Thank you. Um, nobody has uh, specified whether you're talking about all immigrants or just the undocumented immigrants. And so I think that is conversation that needs to be discussed. When it comes to protecting our most vulnerable, I, I agree with that. I do believe we should protect our most vulnerable. And I agree with Ms. Uh, Yeager about, Walker Yeager about uh, our homeless and uh, the situations that they find themselves in with their IDs being stolen and um, misplaced a lot, things like that. So uh, I'm open-minded and I'm willing, I do wanna be in on these discussions, but I've not done my due diligence to know exactly what all this involves. And so I, um, you know, like I said, I do believe in protecting our most vulnerable. I do um, want our documented in immigrants to be very safe and welcomed here. Um, so whatever, you know, conversations are going on about this, I do hope to be a part of that. Thank you. Thank you. And now to Jane Philbrook. Well, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to address this. Um, in concept, and in actuality, I believe that all of our folks should be protected. I don't believe they should be concerned and worried because they don't have an ID, which then means it's hard for them to get care and um, appropriate community involvement. But um, I also want to say that I do know that the police have started an ID for the homeless to work with and have a bunch of folks working with them to do that. That's just a beginning, but that is a step. And because of the this movement, I believe that is why that has happened. Um, and I don't know, but I get to see Diana's face right now on the main screen. And I like to see you, I'd like to see you nodding at me. That's really great. Um, so, the other thing is, is that with all of this, um, if it weren't for our immigrants, Central Avenue and Minnesota Avenue would be dead, in my opinion. There would not be anything going on. And I have to tell you, I'm really excited about the fact that we have all that going on. The other thing I would like to suggest is, is that we pull together, as other folks have suggested, a conversation and when I say a conversation, I mean pros and cons and in-betweens and people that know and people that don't know, and then ask at someone who is not um, in what I wanna say, ha have an ax to grind in this, somebody that is from outside our community, like the Kansas leadership folks, um, handle that meeting because that way it can be organized and it will not be um, from one side or the other, but an open community conversation. And that's just a suggestion I would have. Um, that Thank you. In other locations and other jobs that we've tried to do. Thank you. Thank you, Jane Phil Brooks. And uh, now to Burroughs. Well, thank you. 
uh, I've met with the ACLU about three, four years ago, and through that discussion, became supportive of the municipal ID. I truly believe that uh, having identification is first and foremost a, a way to start uh, learning and being a part of a community. We've heard reasons as to why municipal ID is important. Uh, Roland Park, communities around us, there's been 12, 12 communities that I'm aware of that have already implemented municipal ID all across the country. But the closest one to us is Roland Park. And their, their theme is basically, unless there is a, a public safety threat or crime in progress, Roland Park officers will not uh, provide resources or assistance to ICE. And I think that's a, a probably a very good model in which to look at how we address our policies. We have a new police chief. I know when I became commissioner initially, I did engage the ACLU and ask them to meet with our police chief at the time, as well as the sheriff's department and a few of the commissioners to, to get the discussion and the conversation going. We are, we are a community of diversity and ethnicity, and it's important that we value and respect one another. Uh, and the only way to do that is when we get to know each other as neighbors and friends and as family. And that starts with being able to have a comfort and secure level within our, within our community. The uh, Little Rock, Arkansas recently launched its program with the help of its police chief. So I would hope that with uh, the new police chief being appointed that that discussion will carry us further in into what we need to advance this policy should that be the direction the commission chooses to go. Thank you very much. And now to Melvin Williams. Do you support the full safe and welcoming ordinance proposed by the safe and welcoming coalition, which includes both the municipal ID and the ICE non compliance? I support them for the simple fact our country was built off the backs of immigrations and slaves. I feel like um, if they're good enough to work here, help build up our community and pay property taxes, they should be good enough to be protected. Thank That's you. It. And now to Ned Kelly. Thank you. Yeah, the question is on the safe and welcoming coalition proposal, both parts, the municipal ID and the ICE non-compliance. So my two answers, answer to the first part is a hesitant maybe, and answer to the second part is a definitely yes. <laughs> uh, so the first part, I do know it's important and um, hard for homeless people and immigrants to, to do anything, to function, to establish the credibility in the community without a government issued ID. Those, uh, my girlfriend, Mary Girl and I, and by the way, she's, she's running for BPU, uh, do a fair amount of work with the homeless and we've met a, a number of people. It's, they, they can't get a job because they don't have the, the card, the certificate, the, the, the thing that says they're legitimate human being. Um, so I, I definitely feel for them, um, as well as immigrants. My suggestion, my goal would be to make that process easier, the process of, of getting work, of moving around um, without a government ID. But he, I, my concern is that any power we give to, to the government, um, they're just going to use it and get more and track more information about people. So hesitantly, I'll say maybe I want to learn more about it as far as the municipal ID. As far as blocking ICE, I wholeheartedly say yes, we should make Wyandotte County and Kansas City a sanctuary city and not allow in those the feds, shouldn't allow in the FBI, shouldn't allow in the FDA, the ATF, any of it. Make, uh, you know, make sure uh, they're not coming in to enforce unconstitutional drug laws, um, unconstitutional gun laws, any of it. Let's so wholeheartedly, yes, we should not comply with ICE or any of the feds. Thank you. Thank you. And to our final, uh, Gail Thompson. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who may not uh, have followed this from the beginning, the Safe and Welcoming Ordinance has really two key provisions. Uh, one is the uh, identification verification for Wyandotte County citizens so that uh, they can get uh, access to important public services. And the other component of the Safe and Welcoming uh, that's been proposed is the ICE non-compliance. 
support uh, in concept of safe and welcoming municipal ID. But know as a commissioner that I always have to be cognizant of the language that is presented in final form. Um, also with this particular matter, who is going to be the endorsing entity uh, for the municipal ID and how is this going to be funded? So as many of the previous speakers have said, there needs to be further uh, discussion uh, about this. And so that's why I'm saying as, as a commissioner, I am always cognizant and as a lawyer of those details, the devil is always details, although I support the concept and want all Wyandotte County citizens access to important public services. With regard to the second provision of it, again, it is important for me to see what the language is. One of the things that has not come forward yet, at least that I'm aware of, is any evidence that our police have acted as frontline agents, so to speak, for DEA or ICE or any of those federal uh, entities for whom that is, that is their business. So as a lawyer, I'm also concerned and will be watching uh, what is there in the language that guarantees against something that we don't have any evidence right now has already happened. So I am very thank supportive you. of ongoing, thank you. Thank you, thank you. And now uh, for our third question, and we're gonna start with Andrew Davis here. What is your assessment of the availability and affordability of housing in Wyandotte County? This applies to both home ownership and rental housing. Yes, and, and thank you so much for, for this question. So uh, my assessment is, is this, um, we have an affordable housing problem here in Wyandotte County and we're not unique in that. KCK is not unique in that. It is a national problem. Um, we have to come up with a solution that works well for both those that are property owners and uh, for those that are renters. Um, we have a lot of vacant property, uh, a lot of residential vacant property that I think uh, we can do a lot of stuff with. We have a lot of land in our land bank that we can perhaps uh, 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 do some incentivizing, not only to big and large corporations so that they can have land to develop on, but perhaps mom and pop and small uh, uh, business owners and those that are looking to uh, uh, expand, those that are looking for new homes. and so. Um, my assessment is we have to do more. We have to have a bigger conversation about the affordability. We have to uh, uh, perhaps pass resolutions and uh, use our federal connections and state connections to get more money from the federal government so that we can support a lot of these efforts here. It's sad to say that a lot of the issues with affordable housing and, and property value, it is related to Redline. It is related to a market that does favor big corporations that do the development. I think we need to uh, create more solutions that everyone can benefit from. Um, I don't have concrete policies that I think we should uh, uh, endorse, but I will say uh, on my website, one of the platforms that I am proposing, and this is what happened with the city of Durham, is instead of boarding up the homes, they put uh, plastic and it upped the percentage of sold homes that were vacated by 14%. Perhaps we can do that and those homes that are no longer vacated could be used by those that need them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Over to uh, Jeffrey Kump. So I've actually been in the uh, process of discussing with our own housing authority already that some of the issues that go on with affordable housing. I would actually say one of the biggest issues we have with affordable housing in Wyandotte County is the housing market being the way it is. Um, it, there are the influxes of the pricing, um, houses that probably shouldn't be going for what they are, are, are going well above market value and is making very difficult for people to move here or move um, out of their own homes for affordable housing. Um, now, for even you know the population that may not even be in the ability to look into the market right now, we, we have an issue with that as well. We do not have proper housing areas for, for people to be able to not only have a house that is affordable to live in, but hopefully 
expand from that into what would be a functional, um, you know, working career and being able to grow out of that, hopefully having their own homes um, after that. So I don't think the affordable housing is just with the prices of housing, but it's rather with the ability to grow people who are in those houses to be able to afford their own homes, to be able to qualify for their own mortgages. Concretely, I actually, I've spoken with some regional um, development people who, who have made a suggestion that uh, potentially maybe the answer is looking uh, outside of the KCK affordable housing and looking for a private entity to invest in affordable housing in Wyandotte County with, with the hope of giving home ownership to people on longer term loans um, that, that have lower interest rates and, and just qualify in terms of um, being able to have a, a job rather than a potential credit score. I believe that is actually some concrete ways of, of fixing that. Um, and simply just to, to note about the how abandoned houses, it, it's better sometimes to redevelop rather than to destroy um, some of those houses as well. So uh, um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and now uh, to see here, CC Make, what is your assessment of the availability and affordability of housing in Wyandotte County? This applies to both home ownership and rental housing. Well, in some areas, well, first, first of all, I want to say that, that we've already had programs and outside entities who are coming in, um, corporations who are coming in and doing that. If you, at the meetings, they talk about it all the time um, since probably 2019 or 2020. Um, that's been a program. That's how we got the Northeast Master Plan and different master plans, the park, Parks and Recreation or the Parks Master Plan. And so, so we already have those things in place. Um, but just like um, a couple of the other um, candidates have mentioned that um, people are moving out of Wyandotte County and they're moving out because the taxes are constantly going up. They're higher than the other surrounding counties. Um, the BPU bills are ridiculous. So um, it's, it's a combination of all three um, that are kind of giving you the vacant houses that you see and things like that. People are moving away from here due to different reasons concerning taxes, BPU, whatever. Um, so I do think it is a problem with housing, um, affordable housing here, um, especially in some areas in the lower income areas. Um, I do believe that they are putting up different um, complexes like the one in Harold Johnson's area down off of Washington. Some of those are supposed to be allocated for lower income. Um, Steiniger's um, place down off of um, I believe it's Oroville. Um, it also is allocated for lower income people. So we do have that around here. Um, we do need more of it, but we also have plans in place. Um, I think that they probably could be um, advertised better or, you know, having some, you know, trying to get extra people here or whatever. But as far as programs being in place and things like that, they are already there. Thank you. And now I'm going to go over to uh, Diana Whittington. So I agree with Andrew. You had some great um, ideas on ways that we could improve our, um, you know, the housing and, and renting um, to make it more affordable. I thought those were some awesome ideas. But uh, like Cece said also, there is a lot going on. Just in my neighborhood, I see there's a new development going up called Legacy Park. Now, I have not been able to confirm. I was told that it was like uh, rent to own, in which I think that would be a, a wonderful way to help people uh, get into a home, you know, and to be able to buy it by uh, renting to buy. And so I think there are a lot of things that we could do, um, but like, uh, Cece also said there are a lot of the senior living, you know, with 55 plus communities also, and um, they're popping up all, all around too. So we have a lot of places available, but our housing market has just gone crazy. And I have friends who are real estate agents who they say they put houses on the market and they're, you know, gone in, in no time. And people that want to buy houses, a lot of times uh, they've got to be really quick and they have to. Uh, offer more than the asking price if they want to get it. And so it's it, it's more than just, in, it's everywhere. It's not just in Wyandotte County that the housing market has exploded. So I think it's wise though for us to use 
the resources that we have here and try to use some of the homes that maybe are in the land bank and to utilize those to create affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Jane Philbrook. Yes, so I would love to use land bank property in District 8. The problem is that uh, the land bank property that's in District 8 is mostly wooded with um, deep crevasses. They are not, it's not really develop developmental. It's, um, it's because I looked at that several years ago and, you know, it would cost a fortune to try to use those properties. But on having said that, moving out of that, of that particular thing, the land bank, I would tell you that District 8 has the most uh, section 42 housing, which means affordable housing. It's set up on uh, per capita income and District 8 should be proud because we have, Cece, like you said, a lot of things going on in, in this district and we have more coming. A couple of things I can't talk about because they haven't signed they haven't signed the deal yet. So we have a lot more multifamily housing coming in. And yes, it's a pain in the fanny if you want to move into Wyandotte County or buy a house because things are going for 20% higher than what they're even listed for and a lot of times they don't even make it to the marketplace, they're snatched up. So I really do appreciate the people that are revamping houses and selling them. That's great. The other problem is the landlords, the absentee landlords that we have to deal with, that is our biggest problem. And so that, that's it, just we all need to work on that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Tom Burroughs. Well, thank you. The, uh, the, not only do we have to have affordable housing stock, we need safe neighborhoods. And both of those go hand in hand. And it was mentioned about the absentee landlords. We've had a lot of uh, individuals leave our community and when they left, the, the drop the values within our property. It has been stated this isn't a this isn't an issue that's just unique to Wyandotte County. It's all across the metropolitan area. It's led to a tremendous amount of homelessness. Homelessness. We're coming off the, the pandemic and hopefully not going back into a, another uh, issue with the pandemic, but we're going to look at people lost jobs and lost income, and it will be a, a tremendous reverberation through the housing stock. It was mentioned about high property taxes and valuations. Here in the Midwest, our property values have, have risen considerably, and we should be pleased with the fact that our property values are increasing. Unfortunately, what we have is in Wyandotte County, is our tax base is out of whack with valuations. Uh, I have advocated for uh, mill levy reductions on both the county and the city side. I believe we can't afford it with the, it with the increased valuation of our property. The land bank property had been mentioned. A lot of the homes in the inner city were, uh, when they were raised, they were pushed into the basements and those properties are very difficult to build on with an additional cost. I believe that we should also talk to the state and partner with them to set up a fund that would allow for closing costs and or additional closure on loans of those that may not meet the criteria of being able to fully fund and provide for themselves in home ownership. So I'm open for a lot of options. Uh, we just need some clarification as to just what it is, what kind of housing stock that we need in every part of our community. And I stand ready to do just that. Thank you. Tom Burroughs, and now uh, to Ned Kelly. When it comes to what can we do about housing and is it affordable, is it available, both um, owning and renting, less is more. This is one of those topics as a libertarian, surprise, surprise, I think government is doing too much and we need, the government needs to do less. Uh, this is one of those topics government can only hurt, can't really help. It can appear to help with certain programs, affordable housing, uh, Section 42, as, as has been mentioned, but in the long run, it always hurts. Um, things like zoning laws. I won't say that all zoning laws are racist, but I'll say that pretty much all of them are, have their origin in racism. And 
can do their part to continue that matter. Um, things like certificate of need. So in other words, if government could simply get out of the way and allow people to be creative, allow people to make uh, solutions, allow people to uh, use their own money, their own efforts, their own resources, um, and capitalism, free market capitalism, I'm not talking about what we have now, which is not free market capitalism. We have cronyism or crony capitalism, or let me just say crapitalism. When you put crony and capitalism together, that's capitalism. So what we need is more free market solutions, uh, opportunity for people to, to find ways to live and provide housing for each other, and we'll always prevail. Thank you. Thank you. And now, uh, Melvin Williams, what is your assessment of the availability and affordability yeah, of housing? Got, it, in, got in the parts County? I wanted to get in. This applies to both home ownership and rental housing. Melvin Williams. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. We do have a problem here in Wyandotte County far as housing wise, but I came up with some solutions for that already. Number one, we do have uh, a lot of properties in land bank that are just sitting there. What we do is you have two tax sales. You have one for the general, uh, for the Wyandotte County resident only, that's tax sale one. And what we don't sell goes out to the general tax sale for everybody else. Because the tax sale that we got now, these out of town investors is coming in here buying up all the property that makes it less affordable for Wyandotte County residents. Because some people do save up twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. When they get to that tax sale, their money is no good. Number two, I did try to reach out to uh, the land bank to try to form a program at one time um, where the properties that don't sell inside of the, uh, real estate tax sale, somebody can come along who don't have no general contractor uh, skills or nothing like that, you know, but know how to do the work. You set them up on a, a, a level per se. You start off with this, this, and this, everything is done. You get it inspected, then you come back and do the rest. But the way Wyandotte County is set up, they send you to the ringer just for the little small things. So you eliminate some of the stuff, you know, but that would be my solution for it. Have two tax sales and whatever don't sell. You let somebody go in there who have the skill set to fix up their own home so their families can move in. Thank you. And now over to Gail Townsend. Thank you. Um, I do agree, as many have said before, that we do have a, a housing uh, problem with affordability, whether you're trying to own or trying to rent. Uh, but I, too, have a couple of uh, notes about that. And one, I want to take this opportunity to make the public aware of the successes the land bank has had with regard to the revitalization for homes that were um, brought into the land bank that had been uh, forsaken by the tax sale or nobody took in the tax sale. And we are using qualified um, construction people to make sure that these homes are built uh, or, or revitalized to specification uh, and then um, turned over to willing buyers who will buy them outright or some people um, will uh, buy them and, and rent them out. But that program has been so successful that our inventory on these uh, old dilapidated homes in the land bank is almost none now. I think it's imperative and I've supported as commissioner um, steps to make building easier uh, and, and less rigmarole uh, for people who want to do business in Wyandotte County to go through and that's particularly with builders. The other aspect of that is I'm always uh, inquiring about the price points uh, for these builders who wanna come in to Wyandotte County and encouraging them to look at all levels of income, not just the ones who can afford, you know, the $3,000 um, a month in, in rent. Uh, we need to have across the board. So to that, I'd also encourage people um, who have homes or family homes 
not to move out, but to stay here in Wyandotte County and to revitalize those homes. That's what I've done in my neighborhood and in my family. And that's how you grow and continue to maintain strong neighborhoods. I know the new and shiny Thank looks good. Thank you, Ms. Townsend. Thank you. And we are going to jump over to Ms. Lisa Walker Yeager. Thank you. Um, I just want to touch on a little things and I don't want to reiterate. I've been a mortgage broker for over 15 years that I didn't speak of. I'm also a developer, uh, one of the stakeholder developers on 18th and Vine. Um, one of the key factors about uh, affordable housing is a lot of people forget what affordable housing looks like. Affordable housing starts with, like if you develop a, pro uh, a, a actual project on a 15 unit, only three or four of those units are gonna be affordable, okay? Um, that's how they get the tax breaks. That's how they get the increments on some of them. Um, that's what I have been seeing in the past. Um, now let's continue on with the affordability. Is affordability according to your area that you live in and the people that live within that area? That's the key factors on affordability. Cause what I went and seen, what the mayor Alvey had was the new concrete housing that yes, maybe it was affordable so far as uh, the utilities because it was all concrete. This is what the they have counted on, but at $167 per square foot is not affordable. Now let's look in Parkwood where they're taking houses and they redevelop these houses. The redevelopment of the houses, now they're going for 167, 150, but also keep in mind, this was a red line area. So what's affordable may not really be affordable um, in that within that district in a single family home or a one parent home. So this is what we need to keep, in, uh, keep an eye out on. Um, very familiar with uh, the different programs that they do have available. Currently, I do believe Wanda County has a has an inadequate amount of affordable housing as we continue to look at the houseless and the people that continue to become houseless um, out here. Uh, we're looking at a large number of people that only get seven to $800 a month on fixed income or just say, bring it up to $1,500 a month on fixed income. Um, that's not affordable. So. Uh, we got some solutions and we got some work to do here. Thank you, Ms. Lisa. So now we, we reached our last question of the night and we are going to start with Jeffrey Kump. The unified government serves the most diverse community in Kansas. A significant number of residents are not citizens and can vote. If elected, how will you make sure that you hear and respond to all residents, including non-citizens needs and viewpoints? I've already tried to to do that throughout my life. I've I've had many great relationships with people who are non-citizens, uh, and and of course people who are citizens and have immigrated here or may be uh, um, working on their on their uh, green card or working on their citizenship. Actually, my my sister's fiance uh, actually became a citizen of the United States, um, you know, in in his lifetime as as he was an immigrant. So I I think that it's vital to to speak to all walks of life in Wyandotte County. It is vital to be able to take those calls. There's a reason I put my cell phone number on my cards. There's a reason I give it out to people. I want them to be able to comfortably reach out to me and speak with me with their concerns, with any of the things that they may see in their community. Uh, and, and I also am willing to go to people's houses. I've spoken with so many people. I've, I've gone in and, 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 and sat for an hour in their living rooms and chatted with them where they feel comfortable because it's about making our uh, citizens and our residents feel comfortable in Wyandotte County so that they are able to express their views and their concerns to the elected officials. We cannot be out of touch with those who live here. Thank you. To see her, CC Mink. Thank you. Um, so um, I've been very vocal on uh, Facebook about um, listening to the community and engaging the community. So um, I just have three things. I'll have an open door policy. I'll have an open phone policy. And I'll also have an open email policy. And I will return your calls if you call me. I will return your emails. And if, my, if I'm in the office or wherever, I will have open door. 
Thank you. Diana Whittington. Thank you. Um, as Jeffrey and CC said, I believe the same, that we need to be there for all the residents of Wyandotte County. Um, in my teaching career, I taught in almost all the elementary schools at one time. <laughs> I was a traveling art teacher for 25 years and the last 15 years at Wyandotte, or sorry, Washington. And uh, anyway, Washington has a very diverse population as does our entire community of, of Wyandotte County. And so it's so important to um, appreciate and reach out to all the different people that we have and to be there for them. So like Jeffrey, I have my phone number and my email on my cards and my information. And I encourage anybody to reach out to me at any time. Thank you. Thank you. Jane Philbrook. Yes, uh, for, for asking that. Um, we do have a very diverse community and I'm proud to have grown up in that community. It's allowed me to understand a lot more about other people's lives. But beyond that, I just want to bring up the fact that being an optometrist, I'm blessed so much to have had a lot of different folks sitting in that chair and caring for them. And so what's said in my chair is stays in my office, but folks share a lot of information with me about what's going on in their lives in Wyandotte County. And so I just, I couldn't I, there's no way I could go door to door and get that kind of information because people trust their doctor and I'm so blessed that they do. So that allows me to help care for Wyandotte County in a better way. So thank you for asking that. Thank you. Over to Tom Burroughs. Thank you. I was trying to get trying to get my mute button off. The, you know, as I stated, uh, having been uh, a member of a number of organizations throughout our community, it's provided me a tremendous opportunity to to meet and see segments of our community that many may dismiss, and that that concerns me greatly. As I stated early on in my introduction, that uh, this community is is the ethnicity and the diversity are things that have provided me as a public servant an opportunity to one, not only visit, but to join. I'm a member of a number of organizations around this community. I attend numerous churches uh, for the opportunity to hear differences, uh, and but at the same time grow as an individual. I'm very proud of the fact that you know, if you're my friend, you're my friend. It doesn't matter what, what your social economic situation is. What, what your ethnicity is. You're my friend and you're a member of this community. I've lived in this community my entire life and I had opportunities to leave, but I've chosen to stay here. My wife and I have been married 40 years and we have a multitude of friends that we call family. And because of that, I think we're blessed to be part of a community that not only recognizes the diversity and the challenges we have, but embraces them and works to make them better. Uh, I, I stand ready to continue to represent the many voices in our community, those that uh, may even uh, think they're not heard, but you know, it's a matter of not only listening, it's really hearing what is uh, on people's minds throughout our community. And every one of them brings a point of value to the conversation. And every one of them is a member of our community and a member of the Wyandotte County family. So I. I embrace that diversity as I've stated it all along and I'm very proud to be a member of the, the DOT family. Thank you. So now to Ned Kelly, the unified government serves the most diverse community in Kansas. A significant number of residents are not citizens and can vote. If elected, how will you make sure that you hear and respond to all residents, including non-citizens needs and viewpoints? And Ned, you are on mute. Still have you on mute. Let's see. Can Thanks. We get... We're good? 
Yes. Awesome. I think last time I spoke over Melvin, so I, I muted myself too much to try to make up for that. Sorry about speaking over you before, Melvin. So the question about being accountable and making sure I'll, I'll be able to listen to all members of Wyandotte County, citizens, non-citizens, uh, from whatever background. It's kind of a feel-good question. We got to hear a lot of politicians speak about, you know, how we love, you know, diversity and um, yay, that's good. I, I'm sorry, I, I don't really sound, I don't really talk much like a politician, but yeah, I want to be accountable. I, of course, will be transparent. Perhaps I'll tweet and post every vote that I'm voting, you know, uh, and why I'm voting and, and what way I'm, I'm voting and what I'm, what I'm doing. I also want to, as for, for the sake of transparency, and this is related to that question, did you know that the UG, Wyandotte County Government, you, um, does a thing with a consent agenda? Usually a consent agenda is something real concise and it's just used to, to to vote on things that are inconsequential. We approve the minutes of a previous meeting, this or that. But what the UG does is pack millions, literally, millions and millions of dollars worth of spending of your money into a consent agenda. So it's not um, talked about publicly, at least not during the, the general meeting. And it gets voted on and, and passed in seconds. So what I want to do for the sake of transparency is promise anytime the UG is going to spend millions of dollars of your money, <laughs> I'll make sure that anything in that consent agenda gets pulled out to examine and debated individually. Uh, yeah, vote for me, Ned Kelly, K-E-L-L-E-Y, for at large. Thank you. Thank you. And now over to Gail Townsend. Thank you for the question. Um, I think the easiest way and what I've always tried to do since I've been a commissioner is just as an individual uh, to make sure that all the needs of the people in my uh, district are heard, whether a voter or not, is to try to put my in their shoes. That's the bottom line. We all need affordable housing. We all need jobs. We all need a safe places to walk. We all need health care. So I have tried to continue to put myself in the shoes of my constituents and those who come to me. I hope that all of them will participate in the voting process. And some of that goes back to the, the safe and welcoming and the municipality that we talked about earlier. But whether or not they can vote, I represent them. And that has always been will continue to be my approach in trying to meet them where they are and help whatever their problem is. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gail Thompson. And now we'll go over to Melvin Williams. Being in real estate, I get to meet a lot of people. And uh, I hear a lot of concerns, whether it's from citizens or non-citizens. First, you have to be the representative that will listen to your people and return phone calls and all this and that. Uh, like everybody else who are candidates, of course, we would I would have an open door policy, which I do now. Because people know if you can't get me on the phone, send me a text first and I will reply back to you. I believe in uh, protecting all citizens. I believe that, and this is my personal belief, if they're good enough to come over here and buy a house. They should be good enough to cast at least a local election vote. So open door policy, return phone calls, you know, out of nine years, I will say this, legal and illegal, I have sold them a real estate property. So it is what it is because everybody deserves fair housing. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Williams. And now we'll jump over to Lisa Walker Yeager. Hi. <sighs> Let me just say this. I work right now with a lot of different immigrants and helping them get in from, uh, their documentation, paperwork, setting them up with attorneys. I do that as we do, as on a daily basis. This is what I do. Um, one of the key factors with me is, is when you have an open door policy, 
you have also need to be able to be out in the streets. You have to be out in your community. When I mean streets, I mean in your community. You have to be seen in your community for people to also approach you because everybody does not know how. So my key factor is, is that having um, meetings, and I like to, normally I would, would say at least once monthly meetings. So therefore we can inform the community of what's going on. We can also inform them of new programs that we have out. We can educate and inform. Those are the key factors on how you be able to assist, answer, and listen to people. Because some people might have a, a, a stigma about wanting to come into the UG government part to knock on that door. So being visible in your community is key. And that's what I say. Thank you. Andrew Davis, the unified government serves the most diverse community in Kansas. A significant number of residents are not citizens and can vote. If elected, how will you make sure that you hear and respond to all residents, including not citizen needs and viewpoints? Okay, and, and thank you so much for that question. Um, so for me, I've tried to model this response um, while running, not just waiting, you know, until, you know, getting elected. Um, I've hosted a town hall, uh, we call it town hall at the park for uh, uh, my campaign. I've hosted uh, Facebook Live where anyone, uh, regardless of your uh, uh, immigration or citizenship status, could ask me a question. And so um, I've tried to model being present in the community, being accessible as much as possible. Uh, one of the things, and I think there have been great responses, but uh, some of the folks that uh, may not be able to vote uh, may also need bilingual services. And so um, I think we should also explore what it looks like for us to talk with our constituents who may not speak English as well, because um, that could be a barrier to them communicating with us. Um, I've committed, and this is on my website as well, andrewdavisforug.org, I've committed to having regular town hall meetings, and I'm definitely open to uh, working to get uh, folks who would like to volunteer to be translators as well at those events, so that whether it be quarterly meetings or every other month, what have you, uh, I want to be connected and I want to hear from everyone as often as possible. Um, I think that is what good leadership is. Um, you should not only hear from me when I need something from you, like your taxes, um, you should not only see me at events. I will go to events for sure, but I will also host things, uh, host events so that folks, regardless of their uh, citizen, citizenship status, regardless of whether or not they speak English uh, and, and that's their first language, I will host events and find accommodations so that I can hear from everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And now we want to allow each candidate to have a uh, minute closing statement. So we are going to start with to see her CC make. Well, thank you. Um, I just want to say that um, first of all, Ms. Whittington, um, I love teachers and I support teachers and I wish I could have met you before all of this, um, before we got on the ballot actually. Um, other than that, um, I just want to say I grew up here. I love Wyandotte County. I'm involved. Um, I'm out in the streets or I'm involved in the community, whether it's Argentine, whether it's the Northeast side, whether it's 8th district, anything that's going on in Wyandotte County that affects our kids, our elderly, or just Wyandotte County in general, um, I'm usually involved there at the UG um, so or BPU, um, and I will continue to do that whether I'm in the seat or not, um, because I live here. Um, before I'm a candidate, I'm a voter, a resident, um, and a Wanda County, um, around a Wanda County. So vote for to see your man on um, August 3rd, because I thank have been fighting for you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to jump over to Diana Whittington. Okay. Thank you, Cece, for that. I just recently retired, though, so that I can focus on serving the community in a different capacity, hopefully. So um, I just wanted to say that the slogan I have on my cards and is 
people over politics, because to me, the people come first and that's what's most important. And to me, that means being accessible to the community in all ways. And it also means to help do everything I can, work as efficiently as I can to help make our UG run efficiently because um, you know nothing worse than having a inefficient government. And uh, so anyway, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Jane Philbrook, your closing statement. Yes, first off, I am very excited to be among folks who are engaging this year. We have the most people engaging in being uh, during this election that we've had in a long time. And I think that is a blessing. And I ask repeatedly that they stay involved as well as myself, no matter who's elected. I also want to say very quickly that I've worked very diligently uh, with a lot of people in the community to get new um, jobs. And that is a big thing and housing and whatever else needs to be done. Um, I'm out there and I'm working hard for our community. And I just want to, I'd appreciate your vote on August the 3rd and God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Burroughs. Well, first, I want to thank the mainstream coalition and sponsors for the opportunity to have this forum this evening. I think it's important that the residents hear from the uh, those that are running for office and those that have been elected in the past. As uh, a member of the unified government presently, I'm pleased and honored to have and humbled to have the support that I've had over the last 40 years. And I do hope that I have demonstrated and earned your trust in the four years that I've had the privilege of serving as a public servant to those of Wyandotte County. I stand ready to continue to implement and work with those uh, policies that advance our community forward, that address the needs of the community that were shared here this evening. And I'm all about moving Wyandotte County continuously forward. And I'll be the, one of the first advocates uh, to step up. And if we start to move backwards to, to be heard even louder than what I've been over the years, but as a public servant in Wyandotte County, I'm humbled and honored would ask for your support for re-election August 3rd. And again, thank you, Mainstream Coalition and the sponsors for your attention this evening and for allowing us an opportunity to be heard. Thank you, Mr. Burrs. And now, Ned Kelly, your closing statement. Thank you. And again, Kelly is spelled K-E-L-L-E-Y. When you look for me on Facebook, Kelly for Wyandotte, or on Twitter, Ned Kelly Knapp. The N-A-P, NAP stands for non-aggression principle. We have faced, not only in this county, but in this country, and in a sense in this world, for the past year and a half, a, a crisis that we haven't faced, not, not in my generation, and not probably in a, in a few generations. And of course, I'm talking about a crisis of government uh, infringements, government walking on our rights, telling us what we can do, who we can do it with, how many people can get gathered together, uh, and what things we need to put on our faces and what things we need to do with our bodies. So there is a crisis that we're facing. Kansas had the opportunity, well, each county had the opportunity when Governor Kelly, again, no relation to me, um, put a set of restrictions and, and rules in place. Each county had the opportunity to kind of bypass that and set up their own restrictions. We should have. Thank we you, really Mr. should. And I'll make sure we stay free next time. Thank you. Uh, Gail Townsend. Thank you. My thanks again this evening to the uh, Mainstream Coalition for the opportunity to um, talk to the voters via this forum. Uh, I would say that four years ago when I ran for re-election, I made certain promises that I have kept. Among um, those being outspoken and acting uh, verbally and, and with regard to support of policies that put money in the budget for fighting against crime, for minority and women-owned businesses, for improvements to our park and rec spaces, improvement to code enforcement compliance, uh, for emergency home uh, improvement grants, money to remain in the business and the uh, budget act, in support of the district attorney initiatives to promote justice and equality in our legal system. Uh, We might have lost 
Gail Townsend. It sounded like she was possibly driving. Oh, no. Let's see. Okay, let's hop over to Miss Lisa Walker Yeager for your closing statement. Hi, yes, I first like to thank everyone who did take the time out to join us and who's also trying to better our community. So that's one thing I like to take the time out and thank everyone on that. Um, Northeast First District, I just need to make sure we understand needs access to life sustaining services due to no leadership with no transparency. Our urban core development infrastructure, we will have empowerment programs, arts and cultural programs. I will also build access to food where we live in a food desert and grocery store where we take go over to uh, North Kansas City to buy our food or way out to uh, parallel, uh, way out there. So our Northeast District right now is in living in a food desert. I also will do safe and secure healthy neighborhoods. We won't have any more parks like this called John Garland Park, which is toxic. And somebody put a, a park in there for our children with uh, methane gas pumps coming up. I will Thank make sure you, that Lisa Walker. we have safe, healthy uh, neighborhoods on that as well as building and developing our youth programs. Thank you very much. And we'll go over to Mr. Melvin Williams for your closing statement. Thank you, everybody. I feel like if uh, we had effective leadership in City Hall, half of us wouldn't even be on this Zoom meeting right now. Far as being outspoken and a critic for your community, I don't see that. Um, what I see is a lot of, hey, can I get a phone call back? Don't get nothing back. Hey, can we get this over here? Can't get nothing over there. I want to know why it is that all our tax dollars that collected down there, we don't get to see it in the urban core. It goes to the legend. One thing I will uh, in place is I will bring the prayer breath back. Prayer breath is back. Number two, I do not work for unified government. I will work for the people of my district. Therefore, I will put together a community um, advisory board. So once a month, we shall meet. Anything beyond that, I'm just a phone call away. We just need more effective leadership. And to one of the candidates that said we're moving forward, actually, we're still 20 years behind. We're giving our land away for free for people who want to come and develop for something that we don't want. Thank you, Mr. Williams. We're going to jump over to Andrew Davis for his closing statement. Thank you to everyone who put on this uh, candidate forum. Um, it, it's been a, an honor. Um, the theme of my campaign is change can't wait because I believe we need new and fresh leadership here in Wyandotte County. Uh, some of the platforms that I'm running on is obviously I endorse the safe and welcoming ordinance. I wanna support our small businesses through, our, uh, through a dot business directory. Uh, and I want to give our youth a chance to be heard as well and have a youth UG advisory board. You can find out more about my campaign at andrewdavisforug.org. My campaign phone number is 913-286-4490. Find me on Instagram, andrewdavisforug. And if you do not want to have to go with uh, long lines or deal with this COVID variant, I encourage folks to vote early. You can vote early in my district, in the 8th district, at Eisenhower Rec Center uh, from 10 to 4. You can also do an advanced ballot. Thank you all so much. My name is Andrew Davis. It's been an honor. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mr. Davis. And for our final closing statement, Jeffrey Kump. Thank you again for putting this all on. And, and thank you, Andrew, for mentioning the early voting. I appreciate that. Um, all, all I have to say is uh, I, I never planned on going into politics. You know, but I'm, I'm first a father, a, a husband, and a son, and a, and a resident of Wyandotte County. Um, uh, this is what I will be, regardless of what happens in this election, uh, I'm going to continue to stay in Wyandotte County, and I'm, I'm going to take, uh, um, you know, the notes from, from Dr. Philbrook to heart and, and continue to do what I can to work in this community as I am now growing and becoming someone who can hopefully use my law degree, hopefully use my, my talents to help better the community. 
Um, you know, I only ask that we work together to hopefully build what I think is a better Wyandotte County for not only the youth, but for those who have put in the time to build what, what they hope is a foundation to, to grow on so that they have the opportunities to, to enjoy what they have lived in and, and put in their time for. Um, my, my website is www.jeffreycomp.com. Uh, www um, you can find my phone number there and give me a call anytime and please vote August 3rd or earlier. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I just want to thank all the candidates for coming here tonight and also to all of our sponsors. And I'm going to pass it over to Michael Popa for our closing statements. Uh, thank you so much, Valeria, and uh, for moderating tonight. And thanks to all the candidates for taking the time to share their perspectives. Uh, and I'd also like to thank the organizations one more time who partnered to make this forum possible. The League of Women Voters of Johnson County, Mainstream Coalition, ACLU of Kansas, DOT Votes, and Mid-America LGBT Chamber of Commerce. Both the League and Mainstream will post a recording of this forum on Facebook and YouTube. So please share them with your network of voters. And as it's been mentioned a few times, we are now in the advanced voting window. Advanced voting began uh, July 14th. Um, advanced voting in person begins July 24th. The last day to request a mail ballot is July 27th. So if you're gonna vote by mail, make sure you get your request in. Uh, visit 411.org or ksballot.org before you vote to read up on candidates' positions, find your polling or drop-off location, and make a plan to vote. This evening, we're also hosting a forum at 6.30 p.m. for the mayor CEO candidates. So if you haven't already registered, you can do so at the link that I'm going to pop in the chat. Thank you so much again for joining us, and remember to vote and get others to vote on or before August 3rd. Thank you.